How many of you have ever been out on a playground someplace, you're playing a game of pickup basketball, or you're playing football, and the person who got the ball, brought the ball with them gets upset because things didn't go their way, and they say, that's it, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. <laughs> Does that ever happen? Those of you that are about my age would remember Cartman. I'm not going to say what Cartman said, so, but... You want to know later, look it up, or come ask me later. But, yeah, you know, you get upset when things don't go your way, and that's the way our mentality is today, right? When things don't go the way I want them to, what do I do? I get upset, and I pout, and I whine, and then maybe somebody will give me what I want. Right? Is that what happens? Is that what, is that what happens? No, you get yelled at, right? Because that's not the way the world works. Right? That's my daughter over there, for those of you that didn't notice. No, you get yelled at because that's not the way the world works. You don't get what you want all the time, right? That's not the way that things happen. But that's the mentality that we have and that's the way that we get set up. And in our gospel lesson today, that's not what we see. It's a very interesting gospel lesson, by the way. Last week we had Jesus being driven out into the wilderness to be tested and tempted by the devil. And then today we get this, this passage from the end of the gospel of Luke where Jesus is out with the people and who comes to talk to him? Anybody interested by that little tidbit there? Who comes to tell Jesus that he needs to watch out and he needs to get out of here? The Pharisees. Some of the Pharisees. Now, it's a completely different picture than we have of the Pharisees in the Gospel of John, because in the Gospel of John, all of the Pharisees are bad, and all of them are out to get Jesus, except for the select few of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And did you realize that those two were Pharisees, right? The two that took Jesus down off the cross, that requested from Pilate that they be allowed to take his body off the cross, were Pharisees who followed Jesus. Nicodemus, actually, is a sermon for a different time, but Nicodemus, in in my estimation, is the best portrait of what a disciple should be. Someone who questioned about Jesus and learned more about him and came to know more about him and followed after him all of his life and grew deeper in faith as he went. But that's a completely different sermon for a completely different time. But the, some of the Pharisees come and tell Jesus that Herod is coming after him. And, and Jesus says, big deal, I've got something to do and I'm not going to stop doing it. Regardless of what's going to happen, I have something that I need to fulfill and therefore I'm going to fulfill it. And there's many times that I've wanted to do things for all of you, but yet you're not willing to have it happen. Is that what Jesus said? That's actually my paraphrase of what Jesus just said in the Gospel of Luke. Because he said, go and tell that fox, right? You you want to be called a fox now, right? Right? Fox, right? That's a good thing. In in Jesus' day, it's not a good thing. When he says, go and tell Herod that fox that I'm still coming and I'm going to do these things and I'm going to cure people and I'm going to do all of this stuff, that's not a good thing for Herod to be called a fox. And Jesus says that he's going to be doing what he's going to be doing regardless of what these people are saying about him. Regardless of what he knows is going to happen to him. And then he says, oh, Jerusalem, I can't be killed until I go to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I wish how I could long for and wish that you would allow me to gather all of you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and protects them and holds them close and keeps them with him. You see, we, we want to do all the things that we can during the season of Lent to make sure that we're doing it right and that we're doing enough so that we can be accepted by God and we can get the right things. I've been seeing a lot of these things lately and I'm not one to talk about politics, but it just has gotten me to the point that I have to... You know, just Because it's all this stuff about how everybody's entitled to something and nobody's entitled to nothing. The world owes not every one of us nothing. And every one of us, the only thing that the world owes us, the only thing that we're owed in everything is to be eternally damned and be separated from God for all of eternity. That's the only thing that any one of us is ever owed. Period. Because none of us are good enough. None of us have done the right things. None of, and I'm saying this to myself, not to you. Well, you, you're just in the crossfire, so that just kind of happens. But 
right? I haven't done what I need to do to be able to be with God. There's no way that God could love me. There's no way that God could give me the things that I need because I've done so many horrible and nasty things in my life that there's no way that God could ever love me. And the only thing that I deserve is eternal damnation. But I don't get it. Why? There's a story that the speaker for JYG told the kids last night about um, this time that he was watching the, the Amazing Race. How many of you have ever seen The Amazing Race, right? It's a, it's a TV story where couples join together and they race all over the world and they've got to do these things and they've got to cross, you know, when there's a finish line, they've got to cross the finish line together, right, as a team. It's like Monsters University where the first two monsters cross the line and the rest of their team is still... Obviously, some of you haven't seen that because you're looking at me like I'm crazy. But it's a good movie. You should watch it. But The Amazing Race, right? There's this one break. And I don't remember what season it was or anything. I didn't catch that part of the story. All I, I got him talking. All I heard out of the story was uh, this, they had to race up this hill to cross the finish line before they were going to get, you know, removed from the race completely. And the husband's like all the way up the hill. And the wife is down the hill. And he's standing up there. Trying to coax her to come up and spend more time to come up. It would be the exact opposite if I was doing this with my wife. I would be the one at the bottom of the hill going, I can't do it anymore. But the husband looks down at the wife and he says, imagine that Jesus is up here on the top of the hill and he's waiting to give you a hug. And he's waiting for you to come and be with him. And, and the speaker said, wow, somebody just talked about Jesus on national TV and it wasn't in a bad way. It was a beautiful thing. And his friend's sitting there watching with him, and he goes, Oh my gosh, I can't believe it! He's doing that! That is so horrible! And the speaker, Dan, I think his name's Dan, looked at his friend, and he goes, Why is that so horrible? He says, Because that's not the Jesus that I know. The Jesus that I know is not standing at the top of the hill, waiting for you to come to him, watching you struggle and going, Man, you're doing really bad, but at some point you might actually make it up here. That's not the Jesus that I know. The Jesus that I know is going to come down the hill and he's going to pick me up. And if he has to, he's going to carry me up the hill the rest of the way. And he's going to help me get across that line. That's the thing that God promises each and every one of us. He's not going to leave us on the hill to struggle. He's going to come there and be with us. That's what he did on the cross. That's what he did when he came to take away what each and every one of us deserves. Right? Right? Jesus is not going to leave us there because that's not what Jesus does. In the face of damnation, in the face of death, in the face of ridicule, Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem because that's what I've got to do. And it's not about us. That's the thing that we've got to forget about. It's not about us. It's not about us getting what we want all the time. It's not about us getting what we deserve. Because if we got that, none of us would be happy. It's about what God does for each and every one of us. It's, and it's spread throughout the scriptures here this morning. We didn't really see it. It's not completely clear in Genesis. But it's there in Genesis. It talks about how um, Abraham is going to be the father of many nations, right? Go out and count the stars if you can. That's how many offspring you're going to have. And then what does he do? He has him bring a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he cuts them in half. And he lays them out on the ground. But he didn't cut the birds. Don't forget that. I don't know why that's important, but don't forget that. <laughs> And then at night, Abraham falls asleep. And what happens? A firing pot and a torch go between these animals. Now, what does that mean? Does anybody understand what that means? What just happened there is God made a covenant with Abraham. And the way that covenants were made in Abraham's day is you would take animals and you would cut them apart. And both parties would walk through them. Both parties would walk through them. And if either party broke the covenant, you know what happened? The other party was able to do to you what was done to those animals. Who walked through the animals? God did. Did Abraham? We don't have a part in this, people. It's not about us. 
God made the covenant. And he did it with each and every one of us. And that's the place that he did it. It's not about what we do. It's not about what we're owed. It's not about how we feel. It's about us doing what God has called us to do. And going out into the world and sharing his love with everybody. Because he is going to transform the body of our humiliations to be conformed with the body of his glory. Because it's all about us living out our lives as God has called us to. Not being worried about what anybody else is saying about us. Not being worried about what's going to happen to us. Because in the end, God has complete control. Does that mean it's going to be easy? The speaker of the JYG talked about that last night. He says, is it it's always going to be fun to follow Jesus? Is it always going to be easy to follow Jesus? Is it always going to be without pain to follow Jesus? No. But the one thing that I can guarantee you is even in the darkest valley, even in the moments where you don't understand what's happening in this life, that God is going to be there with you. And that, my friends, is what it's about because he made that covenant. He split open those animals and he walked through them for you. Even if that person sitting next to you wasn't there, he did that for you. Because that's how much he loves you. He gave it all up for you. So my question this morning for you, what are you going to do about it? And the way that you can do that is to live your life out loud in the world by clinging to this verse. This verse isn't here. It works very well with these verses from this morning, though. This is actually the theme verse for um, JYG. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. And in all ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And how can you do that? How can you acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways? The speaker told the, the kids and, and parents of those who are at JYG this morning will be happy with this. He told the kids, he said, the way that you can acknowledge God in all of your ways is to go home and clean your room. <laughs> my daughter turned around and looked at me and said, my room's already clean. Which it is, actually. It's the cleanest room in the house. Um, but that's, that's the thing. Do you know somebody at work or at school that is down and needs some help, needs a smile? Smile at them. Do you know somebody that needs a friend? Do you know somebody that needs help with math homework? Help them with their math homework. Do you know somebody that needs a ride or has a flat tire? Help them fix it. That's acknowledging God in all your ways and showing forth his love that he's given to you. Is it as grand as God did? No. Are you ever going to get to as grand a scale as God did? No. It's not about doing something big. It's about living love out loud. Trust in God and follow his paths. And acknowledge Him in everything. And He's going to make it perfectly clear what you need to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we need to do. Living out loud. Not getting upset and taking our ball and going home. But following through and doing what God has called us to do. Being His hands and feet. Showing His love to a world that so desperately desperately needs to see it.